Why hello there, my fellow apes. Today we are looking at the top cited paper since 2010 in the ethics journal laconically named Ethics. It's basically going to be a review paper of the moral philosophy of Joshua Greeney, renowned consequentialist and current Harvard philosopher. Greeney has probably been the most influential philosopher on my own moral development. He's tremendously intelligent, in my opinion, and he writes with such clarity and such humility that it seems like anybody could understand him, and that goes to his favour. A uh, real pleasure for the brain. A Christmas pudding for the brain, if you might. The article starts out by explaining it will try to convince you of a thesis, that science can help our understanding of ethics by explaining the hidden inner workings of our moral judgments. Ooh, spooky, science and ethics. Ooh, controversy. Section 1. The Dual Process Brain The first section is dedicated to reviewing dual process theory. Now, very briefly, since I already made an entire video on this stuff, dual process theory is a theory of cognition, with good supporting evidence that tells us that thoughts can arise in two different ways. A fast, automatic way that generates intuitions, called System 1. And a slower, methodical way that involves conscious thought, called, extremely originally, System 2. The fast one is cheaper on cognitive resources and time. It's the one we use every day to make snappy, snappy decisions, like, should I go out drinking with my friends tonight? Yes. But it's less accurate than the slow one that consists of thoughtfully pondering over time, maybe with the aid of pen and paper. Both these systems work together to facilitate human cognition. They work in tandem. The fast one gives us uh, our quick intuitions, allows us to make quick decisions during the day, while the slow one is consciously activated if we want to think about something more methodically and we want to arrive at a more accurate answer. According to Greeney, with brain imaging studies, we can visually see the underlying neural dynamics of how these two different kinds of thoughts arise. Except in your brain, of course, because in your brain, the scan would just come back empty. Section 2. Dual Process Morality Now, since moral judgments are thoughts, they are things that we think about, they occur in our brain, the fact that the tenets of dual process theory apply, quote, should be relatively unsurprising and uncontroversial, end quote. Greeney's big, more controversial idea is that System 1 moral judgments are deontological in nature, while System 2 moral judgments are consequentialist in nature. Here with deontological, Greeney clarifies that he means those moral judgments that are naturally justified in terms of rights, duties, and stuff like that. In any case, the claim Greeney is making is incredibly strong. Yes, even stronger than Luffy's gear forth. And although he states it as a principle, it's clear that he considers it a descriptive fact, subject to falsification. So, he wants to show us some proof that he is right. At this point, Greeney decides to give us five pages of corroborating evidence. Here we can find fun facts, like removing time pressure and encouraging deliberation increases consequentialist responses to moral dilemmas. Performing a distracting secondary task reduces consequentialist responses while having no effect on the deontological ones. These are pieces of evidence that point in the direction that the consequentialism is more system two. It requires more conscious effort, while the ontology is more system one. Then we get other fun facts. Things like patients with frontotemporal dementia are more likely to give consequentialist responses to moral dilemmas. Hmm? Low anxiety psychopaths are more likely than healthy people to give consequentialist responses. Wait, what? Isn't Greeney a consequentialist himself? Keep in mind that Greeney, being a good researcher, is simply remarking that since patients with frontotemporal dementia and psychopaths have less emotions and natural intuitions on how to behave morally, the way they are going to think about morality is going to be more methodical, more learned, if you want. And it will probably take more conscious effort, engaging in system two thought. So these groups should tend to answer questions more consequentially. 
And that is exactly what we see corroborating Greeney's principle. Section 3. What pushes our moral buttons? After giving these five pages of evidence, Greeney wants to talk about his research into understanding what triggers the emotional, deontological, system one type judgments. Through a series of fascinating and abominably mutated trolley problems, Greeney identifies some variables as being triggers for intuitive deontological responses. Things like the use of physical force, or the spatial distance from the affected. Section 4. Moral Implications – The Direct Route Greeney gives some thoughts on the is or the gap, saying that, quote, Scientific information can allow us to trade in difficult odd questions for easier odd questions, and thus advance ethics. End quote. And he gives an example. Suppose we want to know whether capital juries make good judgments, and then we get a bit of disturbing scientific information that the sentencing of capital juries is sensible to the race of the accused. If we believe that capital juries should not, ought not, be sensitive to the race of the accused, then we reach, through this piece of scientific information, a new substantive moral destination. Capital juries, at least sometimes, make poor decisions. Through scientific information, we have found a new moral conclusion. See, Greeney does not wish to claim that we can derive a moral ought from a scientific is. Rather, his point is that moral psychology matters for ethics, that it is normatively significant. Another example he brings up is incest. Philosophers love talking about incest. Should we condemn all incestuous behaviour? Greeney asks. Suppose we learn that scientifically the inclination to condemn incest is based on an emotional response whose function is to avoid producing offspring with genetic diseases. Quote, As before, we need to answer a second, easier ought question before reaching a new moral destination. Ought we rely on such emotional responses in cases in which there is no special concern for genetic diseases? End quote. As is well known, philosophers like to hint at being pro-incest, and Greeney doesn't shy away from the job. Joking aside, the point Greeney is trying to make is that science can transform difficult ought questions into easier ones to answer. Moral Implications – The Indirect Route at the start of this section, Greeney wishes to clarify that he does not believe that emotional-based System 1 moral judgments are categorically bad. They can be relied on when they have been shaped by experience. This experience, Greeney says, may be the experience of our biological ancestors, as reflected in the fact that we have a genetic predisposition to, for example, fear snakes. We see a snake and we are like, Whoa! we get this intuition, this emotional system one judgment against snakes. And this is probably a positive in our life. It's probably a positive fact that this happens. This is a good type of uh, heuristic uh, to fear snakes. Greeny then talks about the experience of our cultural ancestors that, for example, may have passed down to us a fear of guns. And this uh, is still probably a positive thing. If we see somebody pull out a gun like that, then uh, if we intuitively think uh, something bad might be happening, it might be a good intuition to have, to just uh, you know, run or duck for cover. Yes, indeed. I would personally add that it is actually impossible to live life uh, in a complete manual System 2 mode. We can't stop and think about everything with pen and paper for hours uh, for every action we have to take. We have to use uh, our System 1 faculty during our day. We have to use it. It's not categorically bad. In any case, the previous discussion leads Greeney to state a sensible principle, and this time it is an actual principle on how to lead your moral life. The No Cognitive Miracles Principle. When we are dealing with unfamiliar moral problems, unfamiliar ones, we ought to rely less on automatic emotional responses and more on manual mode conscious reasoning. Unfamiliar settings, Greeney explains, are the ones that arise from 
recent cultural developments or the ones that we disagree on the most, where we seem to have conflicting moral intuitions. Now, in these settings, uh, Greeny explains, we should activate our System 2 thinking. This is where our System 2 thinking shines. Section 5. Tilting towards consequentialism. So, when attempting to resolve practical moral disagreements, we should ponder the matters carefully. And this, Greeny believes, will favour consequentialism, according to his first principle. At this point, someone might object and say, but why should we trust our System 2 moral thinking more than our System 1 moral thinking? Well, uh, I think a partial answer to this question can be given by the fact that in other domains of thought, we know that our System 2 thinking tends to give us the correct answer. These are domains of thought where we know the correct answer, like mathematics or physics. So, by analogy, it seems plausible that even in the moral domain, our System 2 mode of thinking will be uh, more correct than our System 1. one. Then our system one one. Then our system one 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 one. In any case, Greeny wants to ponder a very very important objection at this point, and this is: What about all the deontological philosophers in history? What about them? Were they not thinking deeply? Uh, were they just scribbling down the first things that came to mind? Well. Of course not, Greeny says, no, that's not the case. They did think deeply, they did. But they were using their System 2 thinking to rationalise their System 1 intuitions. Quote, their reasoning serves primarily to justify and organise their pre-existing intuitive conclusions about what's right or wrong. In other words, what looks like moral rationalism is actually moral rationalisation. End quote. A hilarious example Greeny bring, brings up to make his point is Kant's hatred of jacking off. Yes, uh, jacking off in the sense of masturbating. You see, uh, Kant famously uh, was into semen retention. He didn't want to lose those gains. So, uh, quote, uh, Kant, being an uptight 18th century Prussian, is uncomfortable with masturbation. But he's not content simply to voice his disdain. He wants to prove from first principles that masturbation is immoral. And he's got a pretty clever idea about how to do it. Masturbation is wrong because it involves using oneself as a means. We today find this bit of rationalisation amusing, because we no longer share Kant's sexual repression. Eh, who are you talking about, Greeny? But if I'm right, this passage is in fact representative of his general approach to ethics. Greeny's point here is that Kant was trying to use all his System 2 big boy brain power to rationalise a System 1 moral intuition, his hatred for masturbation, that was probably generated in him by his cultural religious upbringing. After crushing Kant's penis perceptions, Greeny then faces off with another possible objection. Doesn't consequentialism itself depend on some kind of intuition? If the answer to this question is yes, then it seems like consequentialism is on the exact same footing as the ontology, relying on System 1 intuitions. Here Greeny cites Sidwick that distinguishes between perceptual, dogmatic and philosophical intuitions. Perceptual intuitions come as an immediate instinctive reaction to something like, oh, this spider is disgusting. Dogmatic ones are usually learned, like going around naked is wrong. That is something you usually learn. While philosophical intuitions are first principles that we generally all share, like suffering is bad. For Greeny and Sidwick, and I would tend to agree for the little it is worth, only philosophical intuitions can lead to a coherent, universalizable theory of morality. Greeny casts doubts on, quote, theories that purport to derive from first principles, but that are in fact intuition chasing, that is, theories that are actually attempts to get from first principles to the intuitively right answers, rather than attempts to get from first principles to wherever those principles happen to lead. And, warning, warning, shade alert, shade alert, if you're like me, you suspect that this covers most, if not all, 
of act consequentialism's competition. End quote. Conclusion Greeny concludes with an appeal for a better integration between moral philosophy and moral psychology. The more we know about the former, the better the latter will be.